Yeah. And and then Absolutely. if we move to the the muscle mass and lipids that you mentioned in the beginning. So could you could you explain a little bit the, the basics first? Sure, yeah. So if we look at the, the the exercise research and blood lipids, and if we just talk about cholesterol, there the evidence isn't exactly very, very clear about what the effects of exercise are. There seems to be some small changes in, in cholesterol, but nothing major. But with resistance exercise, what we see is some studies have shown that there's a decrease in a molecule called ApoB. And for anybody who's not familiar with ApoB, if you've heard of LDL cholesterol, okay, and LDL stands for low-density lipoprotein, it's a low-density lipoprotein is a way of carrying cholesterol around our blood because cholesterol doesn't mix with water. Our blood is mostly water. So we need to carry that somehow. And we do that in lipoproteins. And we hold lipoproteins together, or at least some of them, with a molecule of ApoB. So ApoB is just a protein that holds these lipoprotein molecules together. And it's found in LDL, it's found in very low density lipoproteins or VLDLs as well, and intermediate density lipoproteins. And the beautiful thing about ApoB is that every lipoprotein molecule has just one molecule of ApoB. So if you can measure ApoB, it gives you a very, very good indicator of all of the what we call atherogenic lipoproteins. And by atherogenic, I mean it's a lipoprotein that can contribute uh, to atherosclerosis or the buildup of plaque within our arteries. Mm. So ApoB is a, or ApoB is a really, really popular um, measure for looking at our risk of cardiovascular disease in the future because the higher level your ApoB is, the, the greater risk you have of developing plaque in your arteries over time. And some studies have shown that resistance exercise seems to help to lower ApoB. And what our research group wants to do is wants to see what are some of the effects of muscle mass on all of these lipoproteins that we have in our body. And we did recently a Mendelian randomization study, okay? And for, for anyone who is not familiar, that's basically a, it's, it's like a way of using population data to do a very, very large RCT. And we did a Mendelian randomization study that looked at the effect of higher levels or different levels of muscle mass and different levels of hand grip strength on a few different particles or lipid particles in our body. And what we found was that higher levels of muscle mass and higher levels of strength are associated with a better lipoprotein profile. So we have VLDL molecules. And if you have very, very large VLDL molecules, it's usually because somebody's in a poor metabolic health state. And what we saw is that more muscles and more strength was associated with smaller VLDL particles. And we also saw that it was associated with larger HDL particles or high density lipoprotein. And most people will have heard of HDL and they will call it erroneously the good cholesterol. It's not a term I particularly like to use at all. I don't like using good or bad cholesterol. I think it's a gives people a, a bad opinion of their, their lipids. But we see that you get these larger HDL cholesterol particles, which may be better, more associated with a better metabolic condition or me metabolic state in the body. So that's our first evidence that muscle mass and strength play, have, seem to have a direct causal effect on changing these lipoprotein particles. We're planning some research to look at the direct effects on ApoB, but we do have some other evidence from other studies, not, not our research group, that shows the resistance exercise can actually have a direct effect on lowering ApoB by helping with recycling LDL particles in our body. So again, it's very, very early days for this area, but we have, let's say, some, some early research that indicates could be beneficial. We just need to do some more research now to, to see if that's genuinely the case and kind of to prove that. Mm -hmm. And and about the ApoB, is it that the strength training or muscle mass would directly affect it and that would affect the lipoproteins? Or that ApoB is just kind of a measure that you use and that maybe the muscle mass is directly affecting the lipoproteins? Do you do you know the connection? So so those the lipoproteins are held together by ApoB. It is a, a core component of those those lipoproteins. And what we see is that so to give an example, one 
study has shown that resistance exercise can decrease a molecule in the blood and the molecule is called PCSK9. And some people may have heard of this molecule before because a new class of, let's say, anti-cholesterol drug is now called PCSK9 inhibitors. And they are exceptionally effective in helping us to lower our cholesterol levels. And they work because PCSK9 is a molecule that actually causes us to, or sorry, it slows down the recycling of the LDL molecules. Sorry, it increases the breakdown of LDL molecules and the recycling of them. So we have less, sorry, LDL receptors on our cells. So if we have more PCSK9, we have lower levels of LDL receptors on our cells and specifically on our, our liver cells. If we have lower levels of those LDL receptors on our liver cells, that means that less LDL from our blood is recycled by the liver. So if you have lower levels of PCSK9, you actually have higher levels of LDL receptors on your liver, which means that you're taking more LDL out of circulation and recycling it. And that means that over time, lower levels of LDL, lower levels of ApoB, and then hopefully a lower risk of cardiovascular disease in the future. So that's one of the potential mechanisms. And that's actually a particularly uh, a particular interest of ours is to see what are the, the real effects of PCSK9 and what are the metabolic pathways involved in relation to resistance exercise. And, and if, you, if you think muscle mass is usually linked to activity, so do you, do you think this is, it relates more to the muscle mass itself or is muscle mass kind of a proxy for a person being active? So, so do you think the muscle mass itself is the factor or is it kind of proxy for activity? And again, this is something that we simply don't know and we, we need to find out with research in the future. So one potential way that we want to look at this is to do studies in physically active individuals, but do studies where we're looking at individuals who are doing more aerobic endurance type activity and those who are actually building muscle mass and to see if there's a change in those PCSK9, well, specifically for that example, in those PCSK9 levels in relation to muscle mass, or is it just an activity related thing? At the moment, we don't think it's exclusively related to activity, just because if you do, like I, like I mentioned earlier, endurance exercise doesn't seem to have a very profound effect on LDL cholesterol levels. So we think it may be related to the level of muscle mass that somebody can build or at least the, the mm. level of muscle mass they can build in relation to their height. Yeah. And, and this is kind of early, early stages. Do, can we say anything kind of practical related to cardiovascular risk? What, what are the kind of practical implications of this? Of muscle mass, I would say the only practical thing that I would say to people is be active. You know, they, they're, there's, we have plenty of evidence in terms of the benefits of cardiovascular exercise, endurance exercise. We have plenty of evidence that muscle mass itself seems to be protective as well. So be active, maintain muscle. We want to see, obviously, we want to get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of the research and see how is muscle mass having this effect on our cardi cardiac health, on our cardiometabolic health. We don't know that for a fact right now, but we do know that the, all of the population level data that we have right now would suggest that higher levels of activity, higher levels of muscle mass are associated with better health. So we can push people in that direction now for the moment, at least. And may maybe this plays to the kind of bigger narrative or a trend that we have studied a lot aerobic exercise and there, there has been recommendation for it a long time. And only lately the strength training has kind of come to the physical activity recommendations and more and more studies are being done. And it seems that strength training is as important as aerobic exercise. We just haven't studied it, it enough. I, I also had discussions with researchers who are studying like children's cognitive development, cognitive skills, and, and so on. And also there it was that we just have more study from studies from aerobic exercise, but the strength training is as beneficial. We just don't have many studies. So I think this all links to the kind of saying that when we just do enough studies of strength training, it's, it seems to be super important, maybe as important or even more important than, than strength training. Do you, do you see this being, being true? Yeah, I, I, 
I often kind of get asked, wh- which do I think is better, cardiovascular or strength training? And I, I say that's, that's a hard one to answer. First off, I say to people is, when I started my PhD, I mostly only strength trained. I didn't really do a lot of cardiovascular exercise at all. But as I learned more throughout my, my PhD, especially related to the effects of cardio of VO2 max on cardiovascular risk, I started incorporating a lot more cardiovascular exercise. And I'm, I would very much say that you will get most, the most benefit from doing a combination of both mm. in your life. When I carried out my first study for my, my PhD, I, was, uh, I had a meeting with a group of exercise physiologists at a hospital where I was going to be recruiting my patients. And they very, very much focus on cardiovascular exercise, aerobic exercise with their patients. And when I mentioned that I was going to be using resistance exercise, they immediate, their response was, so are you going to be telling our, our patients that they should be doing just resistance exercise and they shouldn't be doing any cardiovascular exercise at all, that it's better? And, and my response was, no, 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 you don't need to worry. This isn't an either or situation. We just, for this particular study, we just want to have a look at what are the effects of, of resistance exercise. I think a lot of people get a little bit defensive and become very, very black and white when it comes to it. Some people really love resistance exercise. Some people really love aerobic exercise. And I think, you know, marrying the two together is where we're going to get our our most benefit. And obviously we do need a lot more research on the benefits of resistance exercise too. Yeah. And and I think from public health perspective, strength training is it's maybe easier to incorporate for your daily life. Like you can, you can easily like be doing something else, having a video call and training your calves, doing calf races or something, not so easily doing aerobic exercise, or you might be able to do strength training easily at home, even without any equipment, like some, some of the movements. So I think it's, it's kind of easier and sometimes maybe it's easier to go for a walk, but sometimes it's easier. And I think if people understand that you can, you can do some strength training basically anywhere, like any, anywhere, I think it could make a big difference, but people mind is that, oh, you need to go to the gym to do, do a strength training. So I think this is something important, try to change that people could do throughout the day, just lifting. Absolutely. I, I, like, I will always be a fan of like encouraging people to, to go to the gym just because it's it's very easily to, easy to quantify and it's very, very easy to progress. But if you look at any of the guidelines, well, at least here in the UK, you know, our guidelines for strength, strengthening exercises, as they're called, it can involve an awful lot of different types of physical activity. It can it include like working in your garden or, you know, just climbing up and down stairs regularly just to get those muscles working. And what I say to, to people is when they are a little bit, let's say, intimidated by the gym is you most certainly don't need to start there. And I would say if you don't do any resistance exercise, you can start anywhere, which is, Mm. you know, the most important thing to do is to start. And for some, particularly older adults, you know, that resistance exercise might be just standing up and down out of a chair by yourself, you know, a few times every day, might be just climbing up a stairs and it can progress from there. You know, it can progress to resistance bands. It can progress to, you know, doing bicep curls with a a couple of cans of um, beans or something like that. So there's lots and lots of ways to incorporate it into daily life. Is there anything else you would like to add to this this discussion? Uh, not too much. The one thing I will say is like, obviously, I'm I'm big on, you know, people incorporating exercise into their daily life. I'm big on people incorporating extra protein into their daily life. But also a large aspect of my research is also focused around Mediterranean diet and how to, let's say, incorporate the high protein aspect in. And I would say to people that, so I, my research is based on the Mediterranean diet. I don't say to people that they need to follow a Mediterranean diet. I just say to people, like, follow some of the aspects of a Mediterranean diet. So, for example, in Norway, Sweden, Finland, there are the, the guidelines for the Norse dietary pattern, which is, you know, very, very much focused on whole grains, lots and lots of plants, lean proteins, some dairy products, lots of the fish, which is very, very similar to the Mediterranean diet pattern as well. And I think people get a little bit caught up on, oh, this is a Mediterranean diet or this is such and such a diet. I think we focus on things that we need to get into the diet, getting plenty of plants, plenty of whole grains, legumes, some dairy, some fish, some lean meats. You know, anybody can accomplish a a very, very healthy diet and it doesn't need to fit one particular template. 
And that, that's kind of what we try to do here, because obviously I'm based in the northwest of the UK in, in Liverpool. And we did what we called a Mediterranean style diet, which is where we got a lot of foods that people were familiar with here. And we just made them more healthy by incorporating aspects of the Mediterranean diet, more whole grains, more fruit and vegetables, things like that. So yeah, yeah don't get too hung up on it. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the protein intake. I think often we are discussing how much you need to eat protein when you are training. What's the guideline for inactive people? How, how much they would need to eat? Do you think inactive people are not eating enough protein? What's the, what's the kind of guideline for the inactive people and the, the kind of situation? So it, it, it's a tough one to call because, so I'm by training, I'm a nutritionist. So technically I should be like saying, yeah, nutrition is the, the solution to everything. This situation where we're talking about muscle mass, I would say, without a shadow of a doubt, exercise is going to be far more superior to a to adding protein to somebody's diet. And adding additional protein, well, we know for a fact, adding additional protein to somebody's diet who's not exercising is not going to have any effect on improving muscle mass. It may have an effect on reducing muscle loss in the long term, but I, I, I think it's it's a tough one to call. So we do say that with older adults, we're, we're trying to really, really encourage an, a higher protein diet, which is usually around 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. So for just, just for simplicity, for a 100 kilogram adult, quite a big, uh, a big person, that would be 120 grams of protein a day. That is going to have the most benefit in somebody who's exercising. And if somebody can't improve, like if somebody has to do one or the other, I would say exercise before adding protein. If you can do both, most certainly do both. And that's where most of the benefit comes from. Sounds great. It has been pleasure discussing, I think a lot of, lot of new things. And I think our listeners, we find, find a lot of, lot of interesting points from here. So thank you, Richie, for taking the time for this podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.